Good evening, uh, or good afternoon, everybody. I think it's, they still, this still qualifies as uh, afternoon. Um, welcome. This is the, uh, the final in our uh, series of introductory briefings. We've got a few A students. I think there are at least two of you who have perfect attendance, maybe, maybe a few more. Uh, we really appreciate you turning out. Um, I want to thank Orca Media for uh, recording and broadcasting uh, all of these presentations. It's another opportunity for the information that we're sharing with legislators to be uh, communicated uh, to the public, uh, to folks in our communities through their community access stations. Uh, my name is Jason Gibbs. I'm Governor Scott's Chief of Staff. I'm just going to lay out a few very brief ground rules. Those of you who have attended a number of these know them already. Uh, we are going to start and uh, end on time, so we'll get you out of here uh, right uh, at least by 515. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to ask them. We'll do our best to stop periodically and make sure any questions that you have uh, can be addressed. If you ask a question that requires a, uh, uh, a very detailed, in-depth response, we'll make a note and be sure that we follow up with you. If at any point you think of something after uh, you've left the briefing that you, uh, you want to follow up on, just grab one of the members of our staff or uh, Christine or someone uh, who works with the, the community broadband board, and I know any one of us would be happy to track down additional information for you. These presentations are introductory, uh, wave top, highlight presentations where we really try to focus on giving legislators uh, who are not going to receive the baseline information in their communities of jurisdiction, the opportunity to learn about the work that's being done in each of these areas. And uh, so far, the feedback that we've received from a number of you has been very positive. So this is something we'll take with us into the future. Maybe we'll do some more of these as the session goes on, certainly um, probably again next year when we all come back to, uh, to pursue round two. Uh, there are members of the media who are listening to the presentation through uh, the, the, the live stream. Uh, and also on our Teams link. Uh, if any members of the media have questions, uh, we ask that you let us know offline. We'd be happy to get you those answers. This uh, dialogue is uh, primarily for legislators. The same is true of members of the public. We'd be happy to connect with you offline after the briefing and follow up on any questions that you have. Again, the Q&A and the dialogue is reserved uh, at least for the next hour for members of the legislature. Those are the ground rules. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Christine Hallquist, the executive director of the board. Thank you. And thank you for coming. And for those watching virtually, thank you for uh, paying attention as well. Uh, you know, when we talk about broadband, I know we've talked, it's, uh, some of us have been at it for a long time. Uh, but like any other big problem, stay at it and someday you'll come to a solution. And I'm very proud to be standing up in front of here, you today to say that we, we will get every Vermont address connected to fiber optic broadband. Uh, we, we, we have the, the uh, communication union districts that were set up by Act uh, 71 in order to accomplish that goal. It's a, it's a very robust and resilient solution. Um, there are many states that are now trying to follow what we're trying to do. Um, it's nice being in front um, because we have the, you know, we're able to get the labor resources to, to accomplish the goals. So we have the plans. I'm going to talk about our mission. And our mission, this is right out of Act 71, essentially is to provide universal access to affordable broadband. But we translate that mission into three components. First component is to get everybody connected. And Rob Vietzke, he's the, he's the uh, person who's responsible for the Vermont Communication Union Districts. He will talk to you about how that's going to happen. But I'm here to tell you that we have the business plans, the finances, and the ability to do that. So we will get everybody connected. The challenge, of course, is affordability. And that's really what our budget adjustment request is, is for, is, for, is to address that challenge of affordability. You know, these areas that are not served today, they're not served today because they're expensive to serve. And, you know, there's, a, there's kind of a rock and a hard place about that being expensive to serve because the people who are not served today are typically represent a high percentage of low income folks. You know, think about the 55 communities in Northeast Kingdom, uh, Northeast Kingdom CUD. Um, and so their ability to pay is, uh, is challenging. So affordability becomes very important. And our goal uh, is to try to make this affordable for the rural Vermonters and it is this for people in Chittenden County. This is about equal opportunity for all. 
So the, the way we're going to achieve this is through grant funding. Grant funding helps us achieve the mission. You know, if you look at uh, the cost today, the monthly cost to a, to a subscriber, over half of that is for debt service. So the more grant funding we can get, the more it drives down the cost for the, the end, for the end uh, consumer. Now, most of our funding is coming from federal grants, but some of these grants, grants do require a state match as we move forward. So, so for example, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, oh, uh oh, I'm sorry. Sorry to confuse everybody. All right, so here's a couple of examples for you. The specific, we'll be talking a bit in a moment about the middle mile grant opportunity we filed for. The middle mile grant opportunity is a $114 million grant that we've applied for with the federal government. That requires a 30% match. Um, that, that's, uh, we, we have $114 million, that comes from $16 million in uh, in-kind contributions and then another $30 million from state grants. Another example is the broadband access broadband equity and access and deployment program, the BEAD program, part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. That requires a 25% match. So we can take state money, that 30 million, and leverage 120 million. And today, you know, we're, we're actually really taking a deep dive on all of our business plans with the communication union districts. Because as you all know, there's been significant changes in the last six months and that is the federal interest rates. You know, the feds are trying to slow down the economy through raising those interest rates. And if we look at the 40% of the cost that we have to go borrow, that has a big impact on the, on the consumer. And of course, inflation is hitting this market pretty hard. You know, you, you all know what's happening with the price of eggs. Uh, the same thing's happening in terms of the uh, the equipment needed to build this network. And what's happening, you know, we've got $42.5 billion being invested across the country in infrastructure. Now, we're fortunate that we're ahead of the curve, and we were able to pre-purchase material last year. We saved uh, $2 million on a $9 million purchase. So we are using the collective borrowing power of the state, and we have that advantage. That advantage is not going to be with us for long because of the rest of the country coming on board and starting to build that infrastructure. So the way our business plans are working, we're using grant funding to get things stood up. Our whole goal has been to provide 60% of the capital costs needed with grants. That was based on last year's plan. So we looked at the total cost of the network to be built for the state and said, okay, we need to get the grant funding for 60%. And thanks to the legislature and the governor, you know, we have $245 million in ARPA funds. We expect another $100 million minimum from the broadband equity and access and deployment program. That 60% has now dropped. So we, we are aggressively seeking additional grant funds. So traditional borrowing, just like your mortgage, if you, know, if you look what's happening in the real estate market, I think we could all understand what happens in this market. It's identical to your home. So you go out, buy a $200,000 home with a 3% interest rate, you pay X dollars a month. You go out and borrow at a 7% interest rate, you're play, paying X times Y. And, that, and that's where we are, that's what we're facing today. Higher interest rates, higher costs for labor, higher cost for material. We are still going to get it done one way or another. This is all about affordability, what we're talking about today. So this was the, this was the, uh, the language that came out of the, uh, the, the Budget Adjustment Act. We're looking for $30 million to be used as a state match for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration Middle Mile Program. That is a direct match to leverage this program, and I'll talk about more in a minute about what that program is. Now, I want to make a, one point here. There's been a change since we submitted this application. There's been a little change in schedule. Because the 
NTIA is, is so backed up with applications, not just here, but with, all, with the many other programs. We're now looking at a likely two-month delay. We were originally going to hear back in March. Now it looks like it's going to be a lot more like May. So when we talk about this program, we, if, we, if we do not get the middle mile grant, we want to be able to leverage other programs. It's, it's all about affordability. Because we're going to build the middle mile network. It, it, it's, it's going to cost money either way. So to explain what middle mile is, if you think about our highways today, I'll use the highways as an example of what a middle mile network is. So if you think about, we have interstates. Interstates are limited access highways, you know, few places to get on and off. Those feed our state highways, and then those state highways feed our town, feed our town roads. When we're talking about middle mile, we're talking about the state highways. We're talking about a network that covers the entire state, and it hooks up with Canada, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and New York. This redundant, this is all about redundancy so that we have, first of all, an extremely reliable network. Um, so many of you have, may have been uh, part of understanding the 911 failures. The 911 failures occur because they're only fed from one direction. When you have a ge these ge geographically redundant rings, if a tree falls on one, one place, it can be fed from another. So it doesn't interrupt service. And I'm going to tell you, telecommunications today is even more important than electricity. I was the former CEO of Vermont Electric Cooperative. You know, we when, I'll, I'll never forget the meeting when we were meeting with the federal, federal government because there was a bomb cyclone coming up the coast. And they told us that we might lose our telecommunications. I looked around the table, and our, we all faces turned white because we rely so heavily on telecommunication to restore power. We went out and bought three satellite phones. But I couldn't imagine what would have happened if we lost our telecommunication. Because with all the automation we've done over the years, we could, we could restore power four times as fast as we did decades ago. We couldn't imagine. We started the contingency plan, but we couldn't imagine if we had to execute that plan. Thankfully, thankfully, we had still one fiber that we actually had our, one of our IT posts folks standing by a stream watching the fiber laying in the stream because it was our last connection. Thank God that didn't break. Um, so this is all about redundancy, and it's also about driving the data costs down. When we get greater connections, we'll, we can reduce the cost of data. We want to be as competitive as some of our urban areas. So when we talk about the Mobile, I, I talked a lot about this. It uh, stretches our ARPA funds. It, it provides us resiliency and uh, reliability. And it, um, this network, I'm going to tell you the story about this network. Back in February of last year, we were down in Washington. The folks at the NTIA said there's going to be a billion dollars available for a competitive middle, middle mile network grant. There will be 10 to 15 grants available. We looked at that and said, there's no way we're going to compete with some of the bigger, bigger states. When we back, went back to their next meeting in June, the NTI asked us why we weren't applying, because they said we could have a very powerful application, because we are the only state that has a goal to, set every, to get every single address connected to fiber optic cable. And the great, even greater challenge is if we could get our telecom providers to be part of that network with their existing fiber, it would be even more powerful. And it, it, it's a, not only a challenge in the state of Vermont, it's a challenge across the rest of the nation to try to get some of these telecom providers to play together. But we were successful. We got the telecom, major telecom providers uh, to, be, to be involved with the application. We have the Velco. And we're going to use existing fiber wherever it is so that we, so that we maximize the return on the, on the taxpayer investment. This is a 1,163-mile network. and. Uh, and, and uh, th 500 miles of that is going to be existing fiber. This is the language that we added to, to the uh, request. In yellow, we want to be able to leverage federal dollars in programs 
in case we don't get the middle mile network, as I showed you before, for example, the broadband equity access and deployment program, we can use these funds to leverage 120 million. If we don't get that funds, every $100 million adds 10, every $50 million adds $10 to the cost of the consumer. So this would, this is really about a $20 cost savings we're looking at for the consumer at the end of the day. So we, we're looking to leverage other funds. We do, we're very appreciative of the fact that the uh, House Appropriations has ap approved the grant with its original language. But we would, we, we would like the opportunity to, to come back if we don't get the middle mile grant. Yeah, sure. Question, yes. It's likely not. That's it. I, thank you for that question. I, I, I do want to explain the difference between copper DSL, fiber, and cable as, and satellite. So I thank you for that opportunity to answer that question. I'm going to start by making the statement if it's not fiber, it's not broadband. You know, if we look, if we look at, so if you have cable today, you're, prob, you're, pro, you're likely to get rebuilt uh, with fiber in the future. We know that the larger providers are coming to replace the cable network. Um, we're focusing on the underserved and unserved communities because we know the providers aren't going to get there. Fiber is the least cost alternative for all the technologies. So as things get upgraded, all, all of the communication companies are going to turn to fiber because if you look at the, the life cycle cost of fiber, it's significantly less than any other technology. Now, Cape, you know, fi uh, one, one fiber, the size of a human hair, can carry 3,000 times what a cable can. And I, and I know some people have talked to me about s uh, satellite, Starlink. I've been running Starlink for two years at home. Starlink is, uses radio signals to communicate with the satellite. And because they use radio signals, it's limited in its bandwidth. So two years ago when I installed it, I was getting 300 megabits download. Today, we only get 30 during the day. That's because all these users have come on. So Starlink follows like any other technology. As you add users, the bandwidth goes down. Cable, the same way. The nice thing about fiber, it's really future-proof. When I was in the electric utility, we were using fiber that was built in the 70s. Still worked perfectly today. Um, and if you look at fiber in terms of bandwidth, it, the technology continues to split the light into smaller and smaller wavelengths. So you, you, you know, they're actually, I, for those who are really uh, nerds in the crowd, you know, we're, there, you, get, you can get terabytes of information on a fiber. Yes. You know, I don't, I, I don't know your exact design. It depends where you are in terms of it. You know, the, the night, if, when, when we talk about fiber, we're building a, I call it the 40-year network. You know, we're going to build it so it lasts forever. Um, in the competitive world, of course, you know, it, it, the, the return on investment was made decision. So if you're on a, what they call a, a single feeder, you likely only get it from one direction. But if you're in the middle of a more urban area, you do get it in two directions, likely. So. Yep. Other questions? Yes.
I would say, I'm going to say, yes, we are there, and then I'll give you some details on that. You know, that this, I'll give it, you know, coming from, the, you know, when I was a, uh, the CEO of the Ron Electric, I had this picture on my on wall. It was the first pole that was set in Eden Mills, Vermont. That was in 1939. The last electric state town to get, was Victory, to get connected with electricity. That was 1964. So, you know, you're building, it takes a long time to build these networks. We are compressing it into five years. There will, you know, when, when you ask Krista, when's the last person going to get connected? She's going to, that you're talking about some of the roughest areas in the state. We also have other areas that are going to get all connected in two years. So for the most part, we're going to get it done in five years. There may be some stragglers. Do we have the money? Yes, we have the money to do it. It's all a question of affordability. That's why we're, that's why we're seeking more grant funds. We, we want to make it affordable. At this point, you know, it's, it's expensive. We will get it connected, but, it's, but it costs money. Um, and I say, that, I say that because I think we need to think about those people in those rural areas and their ability to pay. Um, okay, well, we could talk more afterwards. Yes. Yeah. So I'll give you a, a hypothetical example. It's pretty. I ran the numbers in the average for the state. The average for the state is you've got to get a little over ninety dollars per paying customer. If if we got it hundred percent grant funding, we could drive that down to fifty dollars. Is that fifty dollars a year a month? Month. Fifty dollars a month. Thank you. Ninety dollars a month. Over ninety dollars a month. With with the with the current grant funding, the the money we have today. But if we get more. We can, every $50 million drives that cost down by 10. So it's really important we focus on whatever grant funding we can, which is why we're making this match request. I think there's a question in the back. Yes? Yeah, um, the legislature uh, voted to approve $150 million, I think, in 2021. Yes. Up of $95 million, I think, last year. Yes. About 124 million has been obligated at this point. So, we, yeah, and we, we intend, our goal is to get the rest of it obligated by the summer. That, the, the key there is to make sure, we've got five of our 10 seeders, actually, Rob, will, I, might, I don't want to steal from Rob, Rob V's thunder here, Rob V's gay, but we've got uh, CUDs are actually in construction today. So it's really important we keep the cash flow going, and that's why we're, we're pushing the, the CUDs to make sure they obligate all these funds, because once you get your crews going, you don't want to interrupt. It's a rhythm, and that rhythm, you know, that's how you do it most effectively. If you stop, you'll lose those crews, and you might not get them back, and with the pressures that are happening across the rest of the country, we're really worried about workforce. Um, so that $245 million is a good infusion. The, our plan is for that to, to carry us over until we get the bead funds. Now, the delays at the federal government are causing us some little concern here because the, the federal government's overloaded. And if any delays in that could, could interrupt our cash flow. We're working on contingency, contingency plans for that, such as short-term borrowing uh, lines of credit. But that is a concern of ours. It assumes, yeah, the, the, the remaining 120 plus million. The plant, if, with, without, without delays in the federal government, we should be okay. But we're concerned about the delays in the federal government. And this program here, the, the middle mile program, that money comes early. You know, that money could be here by this summer. If we got that cushion, that, that would allay some of our fears about the interruptions in construction. What's that? You got, go ahead. I'm just going to say, a lot of these programs require a non-federal act. Oh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Rob. That's why we can't just use the funds that have already been, been on. Rob Fish is the deputy director. He's, he's, he's mentioned, I'll, I'll repeat what he said, important point. Um, these grants that are coming require non-federal matches, so we can't use federal funds to match them. That's why these state monies are important. 
I think we're just, I think we, let's see. Another point to make this slide is really just what I haven't touched on is, remember these CUDs are not for profits. So any savings they get goes directly to the consumer. So here's some example of some other federal programs that we could leverage. Um, these, these, these are uh, all in your presentation. We're just making a point that it's this, even if we don't get the middle mile grant, we are going to try to leverage other programs. So, th so that's, you know, it's, it's about leveraging the grants so that we can reduce the cost to the consumer. At this point, um, if there, I'll pause for any more questions and I'll turn over to Rob Vitske to talk about what the CUDs are doing with this money. Yes? Okay. Thank you, Rob. So this button makes it go forward. That makes sense. Joining us today, and uh, I would actually put my slides in different order now uh, based on some of the questions and certainly would, would welcome your questions. So um, uh, one of the slides, it's like the third slide, uh, talks about the 10 communications union districts in Vermont. And I want to give you a little background on how we got here um, in terms of uh, building municipal entities to go and deliver broadband to these unserved and underserved addresses. Uh, my colleagues have been doing this in Vermont for a lot longer than I have. Um, tell a 15-year story um, of unserved addresses uh, needing solutions. And in fact, um, East Central, Central Vermont Telecommunications District, EC Fiber, started 15 years ago with a combination of private funding and contributions from uh, members in their district um, and an interlocal agreement to build broadband to reach the unserved addresses. And over time, as they built up a little bit of revenue, um, they were able to go to the municipal bond market um, and borrow revenue bonds uh, to expand that network. 15 years later, they are about to complete the first 24 towns that joined that district. Along the way, the legislature has done some really helpful things. It passed an act that allowed um, town meeting to vote to create a communications union district and to appoint representatives to govern it. Uh, it passed a piece of legislation that um, created the Vermont Community Broadband Fund uh, and created a mechanism through which the state could support the development um, of these communications union districts. And there are a couple things, if you, for those of you that like to go back and look at old legislation as opposed to the reams of legislation you probably have to uh, look at today, um, the, the findings in Act 71 from 2021, um, right at the start of the pandemic, are really helpful. They talk about you know, the fact that through numerous programs over many years, uh, attempts were made to solve the unserved and underserved problem. And in fact, the nonprofit municipal approach was really one that had proven itself because it's really focused on the mission of getting to those unserved and underserved addresses. So, um, you know, a little bit about how these CUDs are organized. Um, each CU organ is organized uh, by members at town meeting coming together and say, we'd like to form a CUD. If two or more town, um, towns do that, a CUD can be formed then other towns can join by town meeting or, or select board um, votes. Right now, there are 10 of these. Um, we, uh, each town also appoints a representative to the board of the CUD and an alternate, and they become the governing body that gets to decide which contracts get signed, how the money's spent, um, and are responsible for the oversight and the representation back to the towns for the district. The district owns the assets. Um, they are committed by by the legislation uh, to universal service. What does universal ser service mean? It means every on-grid address in the district must have uh, service at 100-100, okay? So to the question about cable, um, some of those addresses are already deemed served. So we are not spending any of this federal money or state match money for that matter on reaching um, served addresses. We're spending every penny focused on getting to the farthest location that's not had service before. And so, you know, some of the fun right now actually is addresses that have never had internet before are starting to get turned up as these initial districts get going. Um, as we go, we can go back and backfill um, and offer more competition and other things in the districts, but the money is being spent 
on unserved addresses and underserved addresses where current services don't meet the demands of um, the people living there. Uh, let's see what else. Accountable and transparent. Look, these are public entities. We follow public meeting rules. Um, all of our meetings are noticed. They're available to the public to join. Um, of, of course, uh, documentation is available. And the, the people in these organizations as grassroots organizers and volunteers take that very seriously. Um, public ownership, the assets that are developed are owned by these municipal entities. And so, um, you know, there's some protection that the, the district um, has the ability to uh, leverage that asset over time. There are also public-private partnerships, and so you kind of have to separate the two. The assets are owned by the district, are uh, municipality-owned, but we do operating agreements with uh, commercial companies for scale, um, for economies of scale, um, and for expertise in terms of how you run a broadband network. Correct. Okay. Yep. So, so that's a, the public interest, and the, you know, they, you, the public owns the fiber that's being developed to these locations that have never been served before, right? Okay. Now, now the, the CUD owns correct? Correct. So if the CUD is three towns. The towns themselves don't own it. The CUD owns. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And the CUD has a list of what it owns. Yeah, absolutely. And, and because there's so much federal funding, actually, there's really strong uh, uniform guidance that comes with the grant funds in terms of managing the assets and tracking them and such things. And, and the CUD must keep a fund for when they have to relocate that for the very many reasons that that can happen. Absolutely. They'll have to accrue depreciation fund for moves, add changes, and, and repairs over time. Absolutely. Um, I should probably repeat the questions. I don't know if they can hear them on yes, the camera. Please. Okay, thank you. Feel free to remind me. Um, so private partnerships, uh, you know, again, there are, there are companies that do this and are, have the expertise and the scale to operate these networks, but those contracts are being let through RFPs. If that operator doesn't do a good job, we can move to another one over time. Um, so, you know, there's a good model here of strong public control, but um, leveraging private partners to get the work done. Okay. Um, some variations on how that done, but the principles are consistent. There are 10 of these districts today. There are only a couple places in the state where, um, for instance, in Burlington, Burlington Telecom has had a fiber network for a while. Uh, Vermont Telecom um, uh, Telephone had received a large grant 10 years ago, replaced their copper with fiber. Um, so there are some places where CUDs have not developed, but um, I believe it's over 75% of the addresses um, in Vermont that are unserved are covered by a CUD. Okay. Um, Community-based, I think, is really important. Uh, you know, uh, I am one person, but for each one of the representatives and senators in the room, there's someone um, in your district or in your town who's volunteering, in some cases, hundreds of hours over the last couple of years to help build these programs. Um, we benefit from former telecommunications executives, lawyers, accountants, communications um, experts, and everything else you can imagine who have come together to get this done. Um, I know that in Maple Broadband in Addison County, um, they logged, I believe, over 2,000 volunteer hours in the six months between July and December um, from within their community helping to stand up the organization. Okay. Um, and the last one is Christine's slide. Please.
frustrated because they spent millions who are almost there and the CUD, which has existed uh, for quite a while, doesn't have a plan, doesn't have a budget. Uh, and you imply here that there are uh, private partnerships. Now, how do, can we encourage uh, some collaboration where to achieve those goals arguably cheaper and uh, quicker? Great. Thank you. It's a great question. So the, the, the I, I heard two questions. I'm going to add one on the front end of your question. One was there's a lot of investment um, in upgrades to poles and kind of the shared infrastructure, and I'll talk take that. And the second one is the partnerships and how the CUDs are working with providers that are already in their service areas. Um, so, so the first one, and it goes to a question that was asked earlier about could we go faster in the uh, Northeast Kingdom? Um, there are some externalities to what the CUDs are doing. Um, for instance, pole ownership and attaching the poles, um, getting crews into Vermont. Um, NEK actually has done a great job. Most of the crews they're using are from within the NEK, which is really um, exciting. But there, there are some um, externalities, for instance, the speed at which the pole utility owners can make room on the poles for new cable. Um, that, that do lend to that issue of how fast we can go and could we get done sooner. Um, everyone would love to get done sooner. The second question about partnerships and um, some of the other providers. So the process that the CUD goes through in applying for funds from the state does try to deconflict and encourage collaboration. Um, and you know, th there is a competitive aspect here, of course. Um, and uh, there are service areas and there are business expectations that, that some of the incumbents um, have. And so uh, a couple things that just have to get sorted out. I don't have an answer to you, and we'll, we can get someone to sit down with you and answer that specifically. But a couple things just that are factors. Um, one is the CUDs have an obligation to universal service. So they're not building from the densest, most populous um, places out, they're doing the opposite. They're going to the least dense places and building in. Um, and so one of the things that I would just say that we, you always want to ask when someone asks this question about, you know, why aren't we just um, going with uh, investment in an existing provider is, are they making that commitment to universal service? It's a great answer if they say yes, but that's really important for the, the state program here um, is to get to that every address in these districts, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, Lamoille, I don't think they've done it yet because they're in an early stage, but they'll be issuing an RFP for partners. Um, and uh, they'll be looking for a commercial partner to help operate that network. Uh, those folks should bid on that. Um, and they should put in a great proposal. So, you know, I, I think there, there are lots of pieces to this. I don't know the specifics of that one. I'm sorry, but I'd be happy to follow up and get some people together on it. Yeah, yeah, so I, I have been working with Lamoil Fiber. They are in an RFP process and they are finalists. You know, so they're, that, they are considering all of this. You know, what the, pri the private providers wish we'd move faster, but you know, we do it, we have these formal processes we have to go through with federal funds. And I also tell you that the investments we're making are in fiber, not cable. You know, so we have to get a commitment, and I'm not saying this is what Still Cable's doing, but they, Act 71 requires us to do 100 over, 100 over 100. It's called synchronous, which only fiber can do. So you have to get a provider that agrees they're going to do a universal service with fiber. So Stowe Cable has, you know, I know that conversation has been going on, and, they, and, I, and I'm somewhat familiar with, with what the RFP is. They're making a decision by March 9th, so stay tuned on that one. Thank you. Yeah, and I will. Yeah, and anyway, I just wanted to finish with this. The third, I talked about our goal of getting everybody connected. The second goal is make it affordable. A third goal, most important, is to maximize positive social impact. And if you look at all the things that broadband can do for our rural Vermonters, that they aren't, you know, if you're on the wrong side of the digital divide today, you're also on the wrong side of the economic divide. And so this is about providing the opportunity to partake in all these different programs. So if we talk about climate resiliency, for example, you know, that's, there's it, getting reliable broad fiber connections to every home and business is gonna be critical for increasing the amount of renewables in our grid. Um, and I can talk 
over a beer on that one for hours, so I'd be happy to. Um, you know, t telehealth, um, the whole workforce and the growth of the workforce, we're, we've built a workforce plan that's using Vermonters, giving them co new career opportunities to go into things like IT and even engineering from these. And, you know, I, I, because we're short on time, I won't go through all this, but I do want to make a plug for agriculture. Agriculture is an emerging area for the benefits of broadband. If, and this is, you know, we've talked about phosphorus runoff for years in Vermont. Broadband, when you get to this, what they call sub-meter accuracy that's available, when you get a well-connected network, you can target your nutrient application and, and you get reductions greater than 30% of nutrient applications. I've been working with the farm, 900 acre farms that feeds Jasper cheese. And uh, the, the young woman there, she's like the, she'd be like the poster child of what we want in Vermont. She's a master's degree from UVM, running this farm, can't wait for broadband. She says she drives 100 miles a day just to check the moisture content in her fields. And you think about not only the carbon savings from not driving, but the ability to use her brain for higher value added functions, right? We can, you know, drive, you, it, so there's, the opportunities are endless. And that's what excites me the most about the future of Vermont. You know, we, when we talk about our economic future, you know, we don't have a great road infrastructure. 60% of our roads are dirt. So we're not necessarily gonna be able to compete in manufacturing. We don't have a lot of tax revenue to compete with some of these other states to bring in the big businesses. But we do have a beautiful state and we do have beautiful people, and our government works. Um, and so that's gonna attract people, but the first question they ask is, do you have broadband? And when we get broadband to these rural areas, we'll be able to attract those high margin, high intellectual margin businesses, uh, which that's the way we can support our tax base in the future. So I, that's our presentation, any other questions? Yes. No, no. Wherever there's fiber today, we are not going to uh, we're not going to overbuild fiber with fiber. That's for sure. That's right. Unless we have to go through that fiber to get to an underserved area. But for the most part, you can be assured we're not there. This money is not going to be used to compete in the fiber network. Okay. And, and, and the drop from the poles of the, of the pedestal to the house, how is that handled then as a delivery? So the question being the drop, how is the drop being handled? It's not the same with every CUD. Um, that's, you know, one of the things I like about, you know, one of, you know, Lamoille is really pushing the envelope on that one because they have, because they have so much underground between Stowe and Cambridge and other areas. Um, that's, you know, the, some of the CUDs are following the standard telecom, which is first 400 feet, but others have gone to 500 feet. Stowe's, or uh, Lamoille's pushing the envelope further. That's an important issue that we're continuing to work on. Christine, can you, for those of us who are not expert yeah. telecom what, what a drop is? What's, what's the drop? Well, a drop, okay. Um, is a, dro a drop is what, which it's, it, you think about your electric feed from your pole to your house, that's considered a drop. This is the fiber that takes it from, the, from that, that last mile to your home. And it goes to a, a, a modem and what they call an optical network device in your home. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's a. That's the point we struggle with. There. Are, so the. So the point is that there's a lot of money in drops. You know, we don't. When I talk about having the money to build the network, we're assuming an average of 400 feet. That's really up to each individual CUD to build their business plans. The first goal is to get everybody connected. And if we can, you know, if they can afford to extend drops, of course we want them to do that. And then, of course, you even get, you know, you've got some people who are on the lower income scale who are at the end of a long drop that are being considered as well. That's a part we're struggling with right now. That was fine. When you're providing internet, a, a fiber to the home, are you also, are you reconnecting the, the, the telephone 
one with existing peace home group offer or some other means into into that fiber? Yes. The yeah, what's happening, you know, as, as uh, things move, people are moving more and more to cell phones, and of course cell phones work on Wi-Fi networks. But you will have the ability to keep your traditional existing landline, and guess what, it's going to be even more reliable because it's going to be on fiber. But yes, if, if you look at some of the major telecom carriers, they're replacing their copper networks with fiber and still providing people with phones, and that's what we intend to do as well for those that... Well, we are we are going door to door and asking if they want the fiber connection. Not everybody's going to want it, so we're not forcing it on anybody. Any other final questions? It's a court time. Thank you. Thank you so fantastic. much. Um, just one uh, one point of privilege here. I want to thank all of you for participating in these, uh, particularly those of you who have attended all or almost all of them. It is greatly appreciated. We hope that you have found them uh, useful as you uh, embark on this new, uh, this new biennium. If you have any questions about any of the material that we've covered or anything that we haven't covered, uh, we are always happy to, uh, to work with you to get those questions answered. We've had a number of really um, impressive subject matter experts come in through this series. You should continue to uh, tap into that expertise uh, over the course of the legislative session, and then when you're you're back home full time, uh, and the legislature's not meeting, you know how you know how to reach them as well. The last thing I'll say is that if 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 you might, um, sometime in the next few days, think a little bit about the combination of of presentations that you've seen over the last couple of weeks, plus all the new things that you're, or in some cases old things that you're talking about uh, in the legislature right now. Uh, and try to try to view the scope of work from a project management perspective. Uh, that is as close to uh, an understanding of how we are looking at it as an administration as you're going to get. We have major, absolutely mind-blowingly large areas of operation in uh, housing, construction, broadband and telecommunications infrastructure, uh, community revitalization, clean water to include point source uh, phosphorus reduction, efforts plus stormwater, wastewater infrastructure, uh, climate resiliency, which is wet, which is principally weatherization and electrification of both transportation and our thermal uh, infrastructure. We've got uh, significant systemic instability in our education system, in our healthcare system, uh, though those aren't capital infrastructure projects per se. They are going to require uh, a lot of uh, work and in, in the case of the education system a pretty uh, serious conversation about infrastructure needs we are trying as an administration to approach all of this uh, as uh, on an enterprise-wide basis where we're not myopic where we're able to see the entire uh, field all these areas of operation in combination to I mean to summarize it in the most simple terms to avoid looking really stupid Right to avoid putting down a bunch of fiber one one place and then having transportation come along and um, uh, have to tear it up to put in something else or put in or or put in uh, fiber and then water and then you know like we, we work really hard to build internal systems across our enterprise across the executive branch uh, which we view as a single enterprise uh, to to avoid those type of mistakes but having said that. Uh, having been involved in some large construction projects in my previous experiences, I can tell you that those types of things are going to happen, but our objective here is to minimize them so that we're maximizing deployment speed, uh, efficiency of the dollar, and ultimately the impact that we're able to deliver uh, to your communities. So just some food for thought to try to weave together all of the things that we've, uh, we've introduced over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we really do view all of this as a transformative. The governor said um, this is a tr once in a lifetime transformative opportunity. It is as big. It has the potential to, from a transformational perspective, to be bigger than, uh, and I actually believe, I've got some economists, some academics actually doing this calculation right now, uh, uh, pro bono at our request, because it's kind of a 
geeky, fun conversation uh, calculation to do. I actually think that as a share of gross domestic product, the total amount of infrastructure investment that we are about to make as a state is going to exceed the New Deal. And so if you think, I mean, don't take that to the bank. There's smart people actually doing that math right now. But, but if nothing else, it's almost as big, and it's certainly the biggest since the New Deal from its transformational impact uh, potential. And so we're, we're really trying to get it right. And that's where you all come in asking all these great questions, keeping your eye on the ball, making sure we're staying focused on the fundamentals. Um, because it's really easy to get you know, into like, we got to, you know, I think about Aura um, from way back when. We were like, oh, we got all this broadband money. Um, and we, sp we, we, we applied it in, in the best way we could. Um, and you know, we've got places like Springfield and Hancock and Granville with some of the fastest internet in the world. But it wasn't a silver bullet. It wasn't magic dust. Uh, we still have housing needs. We still have social service needs. We still have education needs. We still, so it's incredibly important that we not only manage the project, but also stay relentlessly focused on the fundamentals. Uh, because they ask about broadband, but they need good housing. They need good jobs. They need affordable uh, places to live, all that sort of stuff. So trying to weave it all together. If you have any other questions, uh, we would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for doing it.